Hey guys, thanks for coming. Uh, on behalf of Bob Henderson, the director of the EMS program here, uh, welcome to CCBC uh, Essex campus. Uh, my name is Sean Barinholtz. I'm an anesthesia and ICU doctor uh, down at Hopkins. I'm uh, a member at Station 32, and I have the honor. Or your, or your colleagues. Basic ocular exam skills that you can use with the stuff you have on you, so no fancy ophthalmoscope or anything like that. Talking about different eye findings that you may see and then how that translates to different diagnoses and you know when they raise red flags. And then help you recognize the eye emergencies that really require transport to a facility that has ophthalmology care as opposed to the ones that can just go to the nearest place 
and just sort of get started on the management. Um, so those, that's what we're going to go through today. So we'll start with anatomy. Again, like I promised, very basic. The pupil, you guys all know what that is. The iris is the colored part. The white part of the eye is the sclera, and it's covered in conjunctiva. And I know it sounds silly, but I have had physicians call me and say, there's blood on the white part of the eye. What do I do? I'm like, did you go to med school? So if I sound like I'm talking down to you, I promise I'm not. There are people who don't know these words. And so if anyone does, you now know them. The canthus is the corner of the eye. You'll hear us talk canthus, lateral canthus, medial canthus, medial towards the nose, lateral towards the temple. That's the words we use to describe the different parts of the eye. Um, if you take the eye, kind of cut it in cross section, we can talk about some of the structures inside. So this is where we were just looking, right? We were just looking from this direction. So here's your cornea. You can see it's kind of like a clear dome that sits on top of the iris. And remember, the pupil is just a hole in the middle of the iris, surrounded by muscle. So the iris is what's doing all the work. The lens is behind the iris. So cataracts happen behind the iris. Corneal clouding, corneal haze happens in front of the iris. So just sort of keep in mind where that anatomy lies. This is the bulk of the eye is the vitreous cavity. That's what has the jelly inside the eye. And then you've got the retina. It's a very thin layer that covers the back of the eye. And then if you take a tiny piece of the retina, the very center of it, you have the macula. So I'm sure you've heard the words macular degeneration. And that involves the center vision of the eye. Optic nerve is the coax cable. It connects your eyeball to your brain, helps all the light travel to the brain, and then get translated into images. So that's the quick and dirty for, um, for anatomy. Now, when it comes to examining the eye, actually one of the most important things that you, tool that you will have when you're doing an eye exam on patient is your own confidence and know-how. Patients are very aware of your hesitancy and your discomfort with the eye. A lot of providers are not comfortable around the eye. I have had emergency medicine people call me and say, I don't know, it looks gross, just come. And that is the entire consult I got. Um, so I get it, the eye is kind of this little black box. It can be the worst thing for some people and it can be not so bad for others. But your own confidence and know-how will give you the ability to do a good exam and provide that comfort to the patient and that confidence in you that you know what you're doing because they will pick up on your anxiety. Um, so I really want to help you to feel comfortable around the eye. You're not going to hurt the eye if you just keep a couple things in mind. The tools you need for an eye exam, again, I promise you it's what's in your pocket. So a bright light source, I'm sure you all have something, whether it's your phones or a pen light or something, you know, you have something. You have fingers, you have eyes, and if you want to be, you know, like the extra credit person, you can get a smartphone app that has a vision chart. And those are all the things you need to do a really good eye exam on a patient either sitting in a chair or lying on a stretcher from wherever they are. First thing is to check vision. It's actually one of the vital signs of the eye and one of the things people never do. <laughs> um, and in some instances, it's not appropriate, right? If you just dragged a patient out of a car, okay, whatever. Like, you have other things in mind other than, you know, can they read this card? However, depending on the call and depending on the issue, checking vision may be appropriate. And there's different, you know, there's different techniques you can use. If they wear glasses, you get called to a little old lady who's complaining of something and says, I lost my vision. You see the glasses sitting next to her. Have her put the glasses on before you check the vision. Because all you're going to get is blurry vision. And then she's going to say, oh, well, I don't have my glasses on. And then you have to do it again. When you're checking vision, you want to, you know, you're not going to have the chart that's 20 feet away. You're going to just be doing your vision. All your, you're not checking them for a glasses prescription. You just want to know, can they see? Can they not see? Do I worry or do I not worry about their eyes? So you're going to be doing it up close. Like I said, if you have a smartphone app, if you have a near card, you know, you're just going to have them read it and see what their vision is like. You always want to check vision one eye at a time because the two eyes work together. And I've had patients that walk around completely blind in one eye and don't even know it because the, the two eyes can sort of cover for each other. 
so you'll totally miss an issue in one eye if you only if you only check them with both eyes open. So really make sure that one eye is covered when you're doing it. And when you're checking in a routine situation, we usually start kind of farther away and work our way closer to the patient. In your, in your instances, a lot of times it will be more emergent. So you're going to start more, more kind of broad and then get more refined with regards to your vision. Even if you don't have a near card or a smartphone app, you can, you can check vision in other ways. You can check light. You see my light, you don't see my light. You know, and that may be all you get, again, depending on the urgency or emergency of the situation. You can do hand motion. So can you see my hand move? And they say yes, and then you, you stop and you say, can you see it move now? And see if they say yes or no. They will lie to you. You all know this. They will lie to you. They want to give you the answer you want. So you have to trick them to get them to, to really understand what they're seeing. So you can do hand motion. You can do count fingers. You can do it here at your face. You can do it at three feet away. You can have your partner do it at six feet away. And that actually gives you visual acuity. So you can get a sense of how bad is this blindness or blurry vision. I've had patients tell me, I'm blind, doc, I'm blind. And I check them and they're 20, 30. And I'm like, you're blind for what, an Air Force pilot? Like, what are you talking about? Because it's all perception. Vision is all internal. All we can do is measure it with some objective means, but we can't ever see what the patient sees. So, you know, sometimes you have to figure out what the patient's really trying to tell you. So abnormal findings, you might find abnormal vision worse than one eye. So one eye's fine, the other eye's decreased, the patient tells you that's new. So what can cause that? Stroke can cause it, optic nerve disease can cause it, trauma can cause it. Um, intraocular pathology, so they, I have a history of glaucoma. So do you take any eye drops? Oh yeah, I'm on like seven eye drops. Okay, well then this decreased vision may or may not be new. So again, depending on your situation, loss of vision in one eye may, you know, may be due to one thing or the other. Vision that's poor in both eyes. Their husband is there and said, we just had an eye exam last week. She was 20-20 and now she can barely see her fingers. Vision that's worse in both eyes is always intracranial. I mean, unless something cut out both optic nerves, which would be tough, I've seen it happen, but it's not easy. I mean, you would have serious trauma then it's something in the brain. So again, just that little thing gave you a clue as to where there might be pathology to help you decide how to triage this patient, where do they go, what do I do, what do I tell the doc? Distorted vision is a less common complaint. You might get that. Um, and this is an example of what someone with distorted vision would see. So instead of, if you show a, someone with distorted vision uh, graph paper, this is what they see. And they're like, I don't know, the lines aren't straight up and down. It's like kind of twisted. And that is almost always a retinal pathology. Because the retina is a very thin layer like a sheet on your bed. So if you like flip the sheet up and you try to make your bed, I don't know, unless you're military, I always have creases. I'm not very good at smoothing it all out. So there's always little lumps and bumps. Those little creases will cause distortions. Retinal detachment, retinal hole, trauma to the retina they're gonna cause distortion. The ideal retina is flat. There's no creases, there's no lumps, there's no bumps. So if that's a new thing in the setting of trauma or in the setting of I was grinding metal or something, you know, that might suggest to you, hey, there might be something wrong with their retina. Um, other things, so the next part you can check after vision is you can check their eye movement. It's very easy. You just, you have them look in like an H pattern. Yes, sir? Just curious what uveitis is. Oh, <laughs> um, uveitis, so uvea is a word for the colored, the, the colored part of the eye that's on the inside. So the iris is part of the uvea, the retina, the choroid. Um, and so when any of that is inflamed, it's uveitis. That's a painful red eye, very light sensitive, but not with any trauma or infection. Um, so the extraocular movement is, is not technically, I mean, difficult. You just have them look. The trick is the patients will do that does not give you any information. If they're moving their head around, they're not moving their eyes around. Their eyes are actually staying center. So what you need to do, and you're, you need to actually hold their head still and say, follow my finger. And then you have them look up, down, and in all the directions. And then you will be able to see the actual eye move. 
When you do that, you will see, you know, something like this. This is when I'm looking straight ahead, up, down, and around. You kind of get them to go around like that. And what you're looking at is, are the two eyes the same? And are the two eyes going in all direction in all gazes? Someone might be normal in one gaze and then abnormal in the other. So you have to just kind of watch the eyes all the way around. It's very simple, very quick. It takes less than 10 seconds and can give you a good amount of information. Um, so again, difficulty with that, symmetry. Does it hurt? Do they, are they not able to do it because of pain? Well, in the setting of trauma, that might mean maybe there's an impingement of bone on a nerve or on a muscle. Do they have double vision? Well, they'll have double vision if their eyes are misaligned. And then some of the causes we think of are things neurologic, like MS, multiple sclerosis, or maybe a brain issue, or a stroke, thyroid disease, optic nerve disease, trauma. So there's a whole bunch of things that can cause it. When you're in your situation, obviously not all of these are going to be important, but as you start thinking of different things, you have sort of choices in your mind that you start throwing away based on what you're seeing in front of you. The strokes that you'll see can be, you know, stroke with a capital S, or it can be a very small stroke that's just to one nerve that innervates one muscle. So the sixth nerve palsy innervates one muscle in the body, the lateral rectus muscle. It's the muscle that lets your eye turn away from your nose. So abduct that way and that and for this side that way. Third nerve palsy, we'll talk about, has a little bit more nerves, but again, that's a stroke to one nerve that can cause abnormal extraocular motion. Increase intracranial pressure. One of the first signs of increased ICP can be a sixth nerve palsy because of the way it runs in, in the anatomy, in the cavernous sinus. Like I said, MS, trauma, they've got a floor fracture or multiple fractures or facial fractures. You know, their eyes can be all out of whack. And then certain drugs. I mean, there's, there's a whole list of what kind of drugs will cause what sorts of eye issues. A lot of them will cause nystagmus, so kind of jerking or up and down. Um, you all know what opiates do. You know, they can affect the pinpoint pupils. So you can have different effects um, from drugs on eye, eye findings as well. So here's some examples of some abnormalities. So this top one, this patient's looking straight ahead you probably aren't going to pick up that there's an abnormality. It looks fine. They look to the left. Also looks fine. They look to the right. This eye is fine. They can look, this one cannot move to the left. Excuse me, cannot move to the right. And this is the patient's right. So ophthalmology, we talk backwards. Okay, so I'm the patient. This is my right side. So this is the patient's right eye. So it's their right lateral rectus is not pulling the eye out. This person has a right sixth nerve palsy. May or may, no pain, usually. May or may not have any double vision here. Sure as hell has a lot of double vision here because the eyes are looking in different directions. Probably has no double vision there. And they'll say, I don't have any double vision when I look that way, but I have a lot of double vision when I look that way. Here, this is an example of a third nerve palsy. So you have complete droop of the eyelid. The third nerve does the eyelid. The eye, if you could see, you could see it just a little bit there, is actually down and out. It's a classic sign for a third nerve palsy. And if you were to look at their pupil, you'd see it's fixed and mid-dilated. All those things together are a third nerve palsy. That is, a, um, that is an aneurysm in the brain until proven otherwise. So that is a big emergency that can kill the patient if it's not recognized immediately. Here you have a kid with a fracture. So trying to look up, this eye's fine. This eye obviously has some pathology going on, but is not able to look up. They are probably in pain when they look up. Some of them, their heart rate can actually drop when they try to look up because of the muscle impingement. So, you know, you can get a good amount, again, information from the eye movement from an, a test that took you 10 seconds to do. The longest thing you're gonna do in an eye exam is check their vision especially if you're using your smartphone app, it takes the longest. It, and it goes up with age. <laughs> so. Visual fields are relevant in certain situations. But again, they're very easy and they're very quick to do. Um, the trick 
is just lining yourself up. May I use your sir as an example? So you want to line yourself up with the patient and have you cover one eye. You can pick which one. I'm going to cover the same side, okay? So you can see. And then what I'm doing is I'm the control, okay? He's looking at my nose, I'm looking at his nose, and I'm using my visual field to know where the edge of my vision is. So if I put my hand out here, I can't see it, so I don't know if he can see it. But I know I can see it. I know my visual field's okay, so he should be able to see it. So how many fingers? See, he looked at my finger. That's the first thing they do. They always look at their finger. You want to have them keep looking at your nose, okay? Sorry, I did that on purpose so that you would look. If they don't look at your nose, you're never going to check their, vi your, their peripheral. You're always just going to be checking their vision. Well, hopefully you've already checked it and you know they can count fingers, so you, or else you wouldn't be doing this test. So well, you want to make sure they're staring at your nose and you're staring at their nose, again, so that I know where my field is. And then you just ask different quadrants. How many fingers? How many fingers? How many fingers? How many fingers? We did that side. Same thing on the other. And if it's healthy and if it's full, you're done. Again, it took less than a minute and you got you got a decent neurologic exam to figure out is there any issue going on to the optic nerve, the optic tract, all the way to the brain. That will give you that information. If they have a visual field issue, if they say, I can't see your fingers, what fingers? Do you have fingers up? Or, or they can't see it until you put it right in their center. If they can't see it on one side, that's always an optic nerve or an eyeball problem. One-sided is not the brain. One-sided is always going to be the eyeball or the optic nerve. If it's both sides, it's the brain. There's no eye problem I can cause to one eye that will affect the other. They don't, the paths don't cross until they get into the brain. So anything that affects both eyes is going to be neurologic. Stroke, trauma, bleed is going to be neurologic. Checking pupils. You all know how to check for reactivity. You all know probably how to check for symmetric pupil. I'm sure you can recognize a blown pupil on one side. Have you ever noticed the pupil shape? Have any of you ever seen an irregularly shaped pupil? If you ever see one that looks like it's peaked or a teardrop, that is a huge eye emergency. And I'll tell you why in a second. The other thing you can do when you're checking pupils that, again, adds maybe 20 seconds, not even, to your exam is called a swinging flashlight test. And that's a test for something called a Marcus Gunn pupil or an afferent pupillary defect. And what that's testing is how the optic nerve is working compared to its fellow eye. Okay? Um, I'm not going to go through the video. I'm just going to do it image-wise. So let's go through it step by step. Here's a normal. All right. You've checked both, okay? You've done it to the one eye, you've checked reactivity, you've checked reactivity, they both react. And then you shine it again in the one eye, and then you swing it over. And as you're swinging it, you get a little bit of what we call hippus, a little bit of jiggling of the, of the iris, of the pupil. But when you swing it over, the pupils stay relatively constricted. And then you swing it back, they stay relatively constricted. You don't get much movement other than little wiggles. That's the normal situation. Okay, let's say this eye has had traumatic optic neuropathy. Okay, they got hit in the face. You're not seeing any external bruises or any issues, but they're saying, I can't see out of this eye. You check their vision. It's like count fingers at the end of the room, but they were 20 20 a month ago when they went and get their glasses checked. Check their EOMs, seems fine. You check their visual fields, it's fine. You're checking their pupils. You check reactivity, fine. Both pupils are reacting fine. And you're thinking to yourself, this guy is FOS and I'm wasting my time because so far everything's normal. The swinging flashlight test will give you your answer. So you're gonna shine it here. The pupil is gonna constrict. You're gonna and it's gonna dilate. You swing it back to the normal one, it constricts. You swing it to the other one and it dilates. And the reason that happens is because there's been optic nerve damage to this eye. So let me put it another way. When you shine the light in the normal eye, that eye nerve, the brain, sees 100% of light and says, okay, I see a lot of light right now. I'm going to constrict because that's what I do. I see a lot of light. Pupils get smaller. 
when it swings over to this one, the percentage of light it sees drops to 50%. And it goes, whoa, someone just dimmed the light. I better get bigger again. And the pupil expands. You go back to the good side, it constricts. You go back to the damaged side, it starts to expand. And you'll never pick up that difference if all you're doing is checking reactivity. Because your light is still brighter than the room. You're still going to get constriction. But when you compare the two sides, you see, hey, there's a normal and there's an abnormal. And this is not right. And that tells you that that guy isn't lying to you, that there really is an issue in a setting of trauma. They probably have optic nerve damage, something that's affecting one side, vision on one side. Does that make sense? The swinging flashlight test is super easy. If you um, YouTube either APD or Marcus Gun Pupil, you'll see a ton of videos. And once you see it, it will make perfect sense to you what it is you're looking for. Um, but it's an additional couple of movements of your hand to the reactivity test and can give you a lot of information, especially in the setting of trauma or someone who calls you complaining of a stroke or vision loss or something like that. Any questions? You said with the ball, the, uh, the, 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 the CF5 and CF6, that only affects one eye and that's inside the brain, right? So, so let, yes, you're right. Let me backtrack. So it's um, to the visual pathway. So when I say it affects one eye, I mean it affects the vision out of one eye. If you were to, in the sixth nerve palsy, if you were to check the vision individually, the vision is, is unaffected. They're just seeing two because they're not lined up. So it's vision of one eye is going to be outside the brain. Vision in two eyes will be in the brain. So thank you for clarifying that. And in the brain, what? Yeah. Well, it would be very hard to be in the brain and just be one eye because once the nerves, the optic tract, so vision, again vision, passes the chiasm, which is right above the pituitary, you get vision from both sides. So if you have anything really in the substance of the brain, you're going to have something on both sides. Whether you could pick it up in the field, I don't know. It depends on the extent of it. But you know, if we were to go dive deep, you would see that there's something on both sides. So when you find an unreactive pupil, you know, you think of certain things, right? Blown pupil, I don't need to go into that. Trauma, you could have, you could have severed that nerve you know, based on gunshot or whatever. Um, uveitis and glaucoma, stuff that affects the eyeball on the inside can sometimes mess with the pupil, can make it unreactive. They might be on drops you're not aware of. Sometimes we put people on dilating drops. So an, a purely unreactive pupil, first question should be, are you taking any drops? Um, or if they're taking any um, scopolamine patches, the stuff they put behind their ears and they rub their eyes, that will, that will dilate their pupil and it won't, become re it won't react to light for hours until it wears off, essentially as if you'd put dilating drops in. Um, so think, think of things like that. There's not a lot that's going to make a pupil purely unreactive. So you know, think of your situation as what else is going on. And then the afferent pupillary defect, there's something wrong usually with the optic nerve, sometimes with the retina. That just means that one side isn't working as well as the other. The causes, again, you have to think of what is your situation. Is it a trauma? Is it a stroke? You know, what's going on? Checking intraocular pressure, um, this is what we'll use in the ER or in the clinic. Obviously, you guys don't have that. You can actually check pressure with your fingers. I don't know if you guys have ever done that. But if you take your own fingers, two fingers, and just sort of belot your eye, you feel, it kind of feels like a grape, right? It's just, it's soft, it's not, but it's firm, and it has a certain consistency to it. And I highly encourage you do it, because then you'll know what it's supposed to feel like. Because someone who comes in with a rock hard eye, because let's say they have a attack of glaucoma, acute angle closure, you will feel the difference with just a finger tap on a closed eyelid. Don't go poking them in the eyeball on a closed eyelid. <laughs> um, you can actually pick up that pressure difference. Very high pressures in the eye will be often accompanied by nausea and pain. I mean, I'm not talking like, oh, I have a headache. I'm talking like, I'm ready to rip my eye out of my head if you don't give me something now. I mean, really intense pain um, are very concerning signs for high pressure in the eye. And we'll 
Inspecting the eye is sort of the last part of the exam. You're doing that the whole time. If your patient's talking to you, you're doing it while you're talking to them. You're looking to see. Are their eyes moving? Are they opening and closing their lids? Are their lids swollen shut from a trauma? So you're already starting that. And I'm going to go through some see, again, all of which are naked eye and just a light of some sort, um, not needing any special magnifying equipment. So, I mean, lids. Lids are pretty obvious. You look, see what's going on. Do you see redness and swelling? Do you see a bunch of spots? Do you see a lack? Um, this is classic for zoster uh, around the eye. I hope no one is calling you for that, but I'm sure you guys get enough calls that I can't even begin to imagine. Um, so that's, you know, that's part of the exam as well. The conjunctiva, you might see a white conjunctiva maybe with a little bit of fluid in it. You might see a red conjunctiva in the setting of trauma or someone that's supra um, therapeutic with their anticoagulation. Um, you might see like a pink eye. God, I really hope you're not getting cold for pink eye, but you know, you might be seeing that. Um, this is actually the lights. It's a little hard to see, but there's a little cut in the conjunctiva right there, like a little tear in the tissue. Again, all of these things you could see just looking at the patient. Um, when you're looking at the eye itself, you might see a little foreign body, a little piece of metal. Um, I can't tell you how many of men usually are working under their cars and swear to me that they're wearing eye protection and come in with this. And I really want to know, are they wearing like saran wrap or what exactly are they wearing? Because it's not working. <laughs> um, you can actually see some corneal clouding here. You see that kind of patch of haziness? That could be a corneal ulcer, and someone who calls you with severe eye pain and decreased vision. And here, can we turn the lights down just a shade? Is that possible or no? All right, no big deal. But down here, this is the pupil. This is iris, and not supposed to be on the outside. So this is your peaked pupil, where the pupil is no longer and the tip of the teardrop points to where the, the rupture is. Because remember, the pupil is just a hole in the iris, okay? If you pull on that iris because it's stuck in a wound, you turn that circle into a teardrop with the point always pointing towards the wound. You see a teardrop, you stop. You stop all eye exam, you put a shield on and you're done. And you take them to the, dot, to the hospital that has ophthalmology. So I want to go through some exam findings, just, just pictures and what it's called and what it might possibly be from, so that if you see it, it's not the first time you've seen it. Um, this is called chemosis. It's essentially fluid under the conjunctiva. It can happen in fluid overloaded patients. I used to get called for this a lot in the ICU. Um, people are getting fluids all the time. But you can also see it in a viral conjunctivitis. You know, where the eye's a little bit pink, but the patient's freaking out because the conjunctiva is like a little bubbly. It looks kind of like a blister. This is a situation of a hemorrhagic chemosis, where it's not just fluid under the conjunctiva, it's actually blood. In the setting of trauma, that can be a huge red flag and can make me very concerned for globe rupture or a retrobulbar hemorrhage. So we'll talk about that too. Thank you so much. No, that's great. Hyphema, blood in the front of the eye. Remember when I showed you the cross section, the cornea is like a clear shell, and then you had the iris kind of a flat floor to that. So that area is called the anterior chamber. That, can, that has fluid. It normally has clear fluid, like a water-looking fluid so that you can see. Well, if you get hit hard enough, you can get blood in there. That's called a hyphema. If you have a bad enough infection, you can get pus in there. This white thing is not a flash reflex. That is a corneal ulcer, that is pus on the cornea, so much that it's filling up the eye, and that is all dead cells, and this is not a happy patient. Um, it's actually uh, endophthalmitis, which is one of the worst eye infections you can get. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, because that is one of the emergencies you'll see. Here's another peaked pupil, where it's a little bit less obvious. You know, there's a little bit of tuft out there, but you might not pick that up, because this person's lifting the lid. But if you just looked at that person, you're not going to see that little tuft of tissue, but you sure as hell are going to see a peaked pupil. And so, again, you stop and you get a shield on there. 
Here's a cataract. Again, just for your knowledge so you can see what a cataract. You see how the cornea, you can see the iris just fine. It's just the pupil is no longer black, it's kind of whitish. That's because the lens is behind the iris, so that's a cataract. In contrast to a hazy cornea, where everything kind of looks hazy. And that can be in the setting of any number of things, chemical burn, angle closure glaucoma, etc. Questions so far? I think this is where we'll take a break, but if you guys have any questions before. All right. How long do you think? How, five, ten minutes, whatever you guys want. However, how long do you normally take breaks for? It's fine with me. Thank you. 
from online, but oh, let's just get sure. set up and make sure that we have sound. Okay, I'll put these back on. Why are you up I didn't, uh, I didn't turn anything off. Yeah? Oh, good. I'm glad. Thank you. I am having fun. This is super fun for me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it turns off when it um, sits for a while, because that's on. Let's turn off and on again. Thinking. This one should have, a, this one has a light. This one's on. <laughs> I've got, like, back in my resident days, I've got a pager and a, another pager. And a Can you hear me now? No? Got it. So the question is about hypertension and visual issues. When you have someone with, you know, crazy high um, blood pressure, with regard to the eyes specifically, some things you may see, you may see blurry vision, or they may complain of blurry vision. Um, unless it's also, you know, intracranial pressure, they're not going to have double vision. They're not going to have extraocular movement issues. May or may not have a little bit of pupillary abnormality because what you can get with an increased very high, very high, I mean, we're talking like 200s over 100s, um, optic nerve swelling as a result from the increased pressure. So anything that goes along with that, blurry vision would be one. They may have hemorrhages in the eye, but nothing that you would be able to see externally. Sometimes it'll, the eye will look red, because if you imagine all the blood vessels being engorged, the ones on the conjunctiva, that's what makes a pink eye look pink, it's just the blood vessels are bigger. So it could be that. But you're not going to see anything fun and exciting. 
from an eye exam standpoint in someone with really high uh, blood pressure. And the treatment is, for even the eye stuff, is to treat the blood pressure and get it back down under control. So the more targeted question, more information was, I came in contact with someone who had really large vision and huge headache. The doc said both were due to high blood pressure. It just that this just I'm wondering if that was something she used to see you and used to seeing as well and what the physiology might be behind that. So yes, um, you, you can obviously with a high blood pressure can get blurry vision, as I said, because when you have swelling of the optic nerve, the fluid surrounding the optic nerve can actually travel under the retina. And so now you have fluid stopping the blood from getting to the brain. So the blurry vision is, is absolutely reasonable. All other things being okay from an external standpoint, this person needs an eye exam to check. Not emergently, you know, it's not, you don't need to chat, chat track them like three hours away because you need to get them to opto. You need to get their blood pressure under control. And there's a really good chance that once that happens, a lot of the eye stuff will get better. Any other questions before I move on? Awesome. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Is the speed of the reaction of the pupils to light significant? I have seen square shaped pupils. Is this a special kind of lens implanted? So yes. Um, in someone, the question was, are there different types of speeds of pupillary reaction and then different shapes of the pupil? You can have what's called a surgical pupil. So if you get a pupil that looks just, just weird, I mean, it doesn't even have a shape, it doesn't really fit a teardrop and it's not a circle, it's like some other weird four-sided you know, four shape, they probably had some sort of eye surgery. Sometimes we have to cut the iris, sometimes we have to stretch the iris to do whatever we need to do. There are some cataract surgeries where we have to put a special lens that can kind of push on the iris and pull it in different directions. So if you see something that looks really weird, you know, you can ask if the patient's awake, you know, or the family member, have they ever had eye surgery? And then there's a good chance that the answer will be yes. You might see scarring. The, eye, the iris is like uh, whitish in spots as opposed to being a color. And that all suggests a sort of some sort of chronic thing. With regards to a speed, you can get a doesn't respond as quickly to light. Um, that can be either a, a sort of an APD, you might call it like a trace APD, especially if it starts to dilate very slowly compared to the other one, or it could just be sluggish reactivity from you know, whatever pathology is going on with them. Usually it's, um, it can either be optic nerve or it can be a, um, like a drug induced or something. All right, so let's move on to the eye emergencies. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, and yes. So you are looking at both eyes at the same time as well, but you're also comparing them. So you're kind of doing both at the same time. Um, and that actually brings up a good point, something I had mentioned, I forgot to mention earlier. When you're doing that swinging flashlight test, and let's say you see an abnormality, and you're like, gee, I, I think I saw it. I'm pretty sure I saw it, but I'm not sure. If the patient's awake, they can actually tell you. And if you shine the light in the good eye and say, how much would you pay? This is a dollar of light. If you do it with percentages, they won't, they won't get it. If you say, this is one dollar of light, and then you shine it in the other eye, they will give you a cent amount for that. They will say, I will pay 50 cents for that. I would pay 25 cents. I'd pay 10 cents. It's really amazing that they can pick that up. They will tell you, and it just confirms that you found it. You were right. Um, but they won't do it if you say percentages. They'll only do it if you do it with money. It's really quite interesting. Um, so let's go on to eye emergencies. I don't want to keep you here too long. Uh, chemical burn, that's a, this is a big eye emergency in that patients need to get started treatment right away. If you get them on the phone, they should start be treating themselves on the phone at home before you guys get there. As soon as you get there, you start treating them before you get them in the ambulance. When they're in the ambulance, you're treating them before they get to the hospital. Treatment irrigation is the most important thing in chemical burns, okay? Nothing else not checking vision, not doing anything else, just irrigating whatever got into their eye out as soon as possible. Because the, the big problem with this is when the acid or the base is sitting in contact with the eye, the longer it's in contact, the more damage it causes. So, you know, again, over the phone, you just start. 
Just start till we get there. And then you get there and you keep going. You don't wait till you get to the hospital to start irrigating. And you can do anything. It does not have to be some special ophthalmic solution. It can be BSS, it can be saline, it can be water, it can be lactated ringers, it can be those little saline bullets or the syringe flushes that you have. Anything that's isotonic, you can put in the eye. Um, you can use, this is a Morgan lens. They have them in the ED. I don't know if you guys have them in your kits. You can use them. I've, I've seen people hook up nasal cannulas to the IV bag and just like squirt both sides. Whatever works, whatever gets the liquid in their eyes, is what you need and I or a bullet in the office with like a little cup or a gauze collecting it so whatever you need to do to get that stuff out or or while this is all going on if the patient can talk to you try to figure out what it was that they got in their eye doesn't matter the treatment is still the same you're still going to irrigate but it can just give the ophthalmologist at some point some information of you know what maybe to expect so, you know, drain cleaners, really bad. Airbag rupture is actually basic. And basic is bad. Basic is worse than acid. You don't want either in the eye, but basic is going to be worse because it actually stays in contact longer and it saponifies, it turns the tissue into soap. So it really causes a lot of damage, um, less so than acid. Again, you don't want either, but, um, you know, knowing sort of having an idea of what got in the eye for, for down the line. What's the best way to irrigate? I mean, all things being equal, I would say that the, the, the best, best way would be this because it's a contact lens that sits on the eyeball and water drips. But uh, I think the syringe works just fine. You just have to pry the patient's eyes open. They're not going to like you and you just keep squirting. If you have numbing eye drops, if you guys have, and you can put some drops in, great, you know, maybe for a little bit, but you're gonna wash it out anyway, so just keep irrigating. The patient's gonna hate it, but they're gonna hate being blind a lot more. These are some examples of some chemical burns of different intensities. So here, I don't know if you can appreciate, there's little green speckles. So like here, and here, and here, all these little green speckles, like you took a little needle with green paint and just dotted it, those are a little more the chemical. This is very uncomfortable, it feels like a corneal abrasion, the patient is not happy, but generally will heal and do well with some ointment, you know, a couple days, it'll start to feel a lot better. Here, the eye is very red, the cornea you can't tell because this is a dark eye, it's actually starting to get cloudy. So not a good sign. And this is the worst possible outcome. This is the cornea. This is not the sclera. This is the cornea. It's supposed to be clear. It's white. And you see how this is nice and bright red, which is the normal reaction to an injury? This conjunctiva and sclera are white. The blood cells have been killed. The nourishment to the cornea has, has been destroyed, and that cornea is dying. This eye has a very poor prognosis for future vision. All of those. That's a spectrum of chemical burns. So you can have anything from, from here to here. I feel that's in the front of the eye usually happens in the setting of blunt trauma. I don't think I've ever seen anyone like on warfarin sneeze and get a hyphema, but I guess it's theoretically possible. Usually I have got bumped in the eye, I got punched, I got hit with a softball or something. Some physical thing came to the face, broke a blood vessel in the eye and caused the hyphema and the vision will go down. You can't see through blood. That's why that part of the eye is clear stuff in it, so you can see through it. So they can't see, and they may really not be able to see. It might be very from the blood floating around. And the way we describe it is usually either a percentage of the cornea or like millimeters, kind of how high it is when you're kind of talking to someone and trying to describe how much of a hyphema you see. The larger the hyphema, the worse it is because you can have a lot of issues down the line with high pressures, corneal staining, and eventually permanent damage. If it's 100% or what we call an eight ball hyphema, completely filled with blood, we really need to consider a globe rupture. Um, and we, are, we as ophthalmology are very concerned about that. So here's a mild hyphema, I'd say maybe a millimeter or two, maybe someone, I've seen this and like my kid, you know, poked me in the eye. It can, it can be a simple, a very minor trauma. 
This is about a 50% hyphema, and then this is an eight ball 100% hyphema. You can't see any iris at all. It's completely filled up. The treatment, from your perspective, an eye shield, because what we don't want this is to bleed more. So if the patient were to hit themselves in the eye, or you, you bump them in the eye, or they bump their eye on the, on the railing or something, they can actually bleed more. Turns into this, turns into this, turns into this, worse prognosis. So an eye shield, and then if you can, if all else is equal, keep the head of the gurney up, or the stretcher, I don't know, what do you call the thing? Stretcher, up. Um, so that way the blood can settle. Because if you think of it like a snow globe, you shake it up, all the, everything is floating around, but then once you wait, things start to settle. So if you let them sit with their head up a little bit, the blood will start to settle. By the time they get in and they see a doctor, their vision may be improved. We might be able to actually see into the eye and not be staring at just a wall of blood to get a sense of what happened and how much damage has happened. Intraocular foreign body, usually there's a suggestive history. I was under my car, I was grinding metal, I was you know, looking at my fireworks or you know, whatever. Um, so usually there's some history. They may or may not have an entry site. We may not be able to see any wounds that, caught, that can explain a foreign body going into the eyeball. And, but if you suspect it based on history, based on what you're seeing, ideally you want to send them to a hospital with opto in-house or at least opto coverage that will come in um, to see that. Sometimes these have to be removed surgically. Sometimes, like if it's glass, we might actually leave it alone. So in some car accidents, if everything is okay, the wound is self-sealing, they may not need urgent surgery. If it's a small piece, it's not causing any damage. Um, but we might monitor them at least, make sure everything else is stable. Something like iron and steel or really bad would be like a piece of wood or something dirty, imagine like a dirty object, really bad. And that person is probably gonna to go to the OR right away to get that taken out because it can lead to terrible infections very quickly. Obviously, I just felt like I had to say it or I wasn't doing my job. Do not try to remove it as much as you want to. <laughs> um, so here are some examples like that. Leave that alone, don't touch. Just put an eye shield on it and don't touch it. <laughs> this is a CT showing you the intraocular foreign body, a little piece of metal floating around. And here it is inside the eye. This is the optic nerve. There, it's a little um, blurry because there's a little bit of blood in there. And then this is the foreign body floating around. And here's another peaked pupil. So perhaps an entry wound for that foreign body. Broke the cornea, the iris gets sucked to the corneal wound, and then that foreign body continues into the eye. Corneal laceration, sort of like the next step on the spectrum. You cut the cornea, again, your peaked pupil. You can tell I'm really like keen on this peaked pupil. I really want you guys to get this down. Sometimes you'll see iris coming out. This is a globe rupture. It's called a corneal laceration because the rupture happens to be in the cornea as opposed to in the sclera or in the back of the eye. But a corneal laceration is for all intents and purposes a globe rupture and is treated as such. A ruptured globe is an emergency. If an eye is broken, it quickly deflates back together to keep everything healthy and to somehow retain vision. It's not always possible, but we do do our best to, to get there. This is an obvious one um, because you have stuff that's inside the eye coming out. This is a less obvious one. What we see is a full hyphema, complete 100%, and 360 degrees of not just hemorrhage, not just broken blood vessels, but of the hemorrhagic chemosis. So elevated chemosis, billowing conjunctiva that's filled with blood. We see this and we take him to the OR and we look for a globe rupture until we can find that there isn't one. Um, do not apply pressure to the eye. <laughs> Goes without saying. Uh, you want to place an eye shield if you have standard eye shield. If not, you guys must have cups somewhere. Just cut off the bottom and tape it on. Anything that is firm and will keep the patient and you or their shirt or anything from touching the eye, you just put it on and you take them to some place that hopefully has ophthalmology. Strongly consider antiemetics if you have them um, because if they start to Valsalva and throw up, well, that's gonna increase the pressure in their eye and that's gonna 
help the contents that are on the inside come out. So if you can, those are always helpful as well. Angle closure glaucoma, we mentioned this briefly. Um, the high pressure in the eye is really painful. They will have this very specific vision complaint of seeing rainbows or halos around lights. So, you know, they'll be like, I'm looking at that lamp and I see like a circle or a rainbow around it. And they have intense pain and headache and nausea. That's all from the pressure going high. The cornea, we call this a steamy cornea or a hazy cornea. The pupil is fixed, probably like mid dilated. Um, and this is a very unhappy patient. This is one of those emergencies that is actually timely. They do need treatment as soon as possible because you keep that pressure up too high for too long, you will kill optic nerve. And that killed optic nerve cannot be restored. That is brain tissue. So you have at most generally, I mean, in the ideal world, you know, 90 minutes to, a, to maybe a few hours. Um, so it's really important that they get treatment right away to re at least relieve the pressure, whether it's drops, if drops work, Sometimes we'll have to stick a needle in to relieve some of the pressure. Ideally, we do a little laser to poke a hole in the iris to allow the fluid to, to go. But you can't do any of that. All you can do is get them to the place where they can get care. Endophthalmitis. So here is, again, another hyphema, uh, excuse me, hypopion. This is that pus filling up the eye. This eye has actually had surgery recently. These are little tiny opto stitches. You can kind of see like a little X, like a figure eight. That is a nylon for that. Um, and so this person recently had surgery, which is a, a often seen in endophthalmitis, history of surgery or trauma, or unfortunately, as I've seen down in Baltimore, is um, intravenous drug use. We will see what's called endogenous endophthalmitis. People don't have a trauma or any sort of external factor. You know, just like they can get endocarditis and other things, they can get um, endophthalmitis. Vision's down, intense pain, and this eye looks awful. I mean, you don't need any real skills to look and be like, what is wrong with your eye? Um, this person needs ophthalmology treatment right away. The treatment is injecting antibiotics directly into the eyeball, and I'm pretty sure ER docs aren't super happy with that, so you really need to take them somewhere that they can get ophthalmology involved. Orbital cellulitis is sort of the opposite. It's a bad infection, but not of the eyeball. It's of the stuff around the eyeball. So you can see this kid, the eye is actually white. The eye looks OK. Maybe there's a little bit of swelling of the conjunctiva, but it's white swelling. It doesn't look angry. And its vision may or may not be OK, but there's certainly no redness or inflammation. All of the redness and inflammation is around the eye. So this is the CT scan. All this schmutz, that's all inflammatory stuff going on. And this eye might be proptotic, it might be bulgy. Um, he'll have pain with eye movement or not be able to move because of all this inflammation affecting the muscles. It may be very difficult for them to move. Decreased vision from a lot of this inflammation can cause some swelling in the retina, just kind of reactive, or to the optic nerve. They can have an APD, but they look sick. You know, it's someone who looks sick. They might be febrile. They just you look at them and you're like, you look sick. And in addition, they're not like walking around like, oh, gee, my eye's swollen. I don't know what's going on. You know, they look sick, they feel sick, and they have this in addition. It's, it's usually orbital cellulitis. And this can be treated with IV antibiotics. So, you know, we want to get ophthalmology involved, but, you know, if you need, just need to go somewhere where they can be seen, get admitted, they can do an ophthalmology consult, you know, that's fine. It's not as timely um, for the most part. Marginal lid lack, so the lid margin is this part right up here. So the part where the eyelid, you know, kind of ends and it's touching the eye, that's the eyelid margin. When you get a cut through that, most ER docs are not comfortable and or may or may not feel like they have the training to fix that. So that needs to be repaired by ophthalmology. Again, all things being equal and the patient is completely healthy and you can take them wherever you want if you can take them to someplace with optho too. Canalicular laceration involves the tear system. So one little piece of anatomy we didn't go into is the tear system. And I'm not going to go into it now, except for the little hole 
right there, and then there's another one up there that you can see when you look in the mirror. It's called your puncta. That's the tear, the, where the tear, hole, the tear drainage starts. So think of it like the drain in your sink. And then it drains into pipes, and then it then ends up in the tank, which is the lacrimal sac, which is deep in the nose. But right here, that's where the drain starts, and then the pipe is under the skin, and then it kind of dives down into the nose. This is a normal situation. They have, this is a stent, but they're putting it into, there's no laceration there, just illustration here. This patient is actually one of my patients. I put that little probe in the hole, and you're not supposed to see the other end because the pipe goes under the skin and deep. The fact that I can see the other end meant it's been cut. It's now open. And in order to close it, you can't just sew the skin together or else this person will never have tear drainage again. You actually have to put in a stent and then sew around it. So someone who has a laceration that to you looks like it's near the tear hole and it seems to involve the lid margin, you worry about tear drainage. And again, obviously it should go someplace that has ophthalmology, all other things being equal. Retrobulbar hemorrhage. So this is another emergency that is really important because it can make a patient lose their vision permanently, but yet can be fixed by a procedure that can be done in two to three minutes at the bedside by someone who knows how to do it. So it is important to have, I spend a lot of time training emergency medicine docs, um, I've worked with uh, army trainers to try to train people how to do it because it is such an important procedure and I just want to try to emphasize to you all to think about it so that you can recognize it if you do see it to at least give the people on the other end of the line a heads up um, or to divert as need be based on what you're finding. So this person has a lot of hemorrhagic chemosis, they don't have hyphema. So they don't have blood inside the eye. The retrobulbar hemorrhage is all around the eye. So if we take a step back and talk about anatomy briefly, this is a CT scan. So the orbit looks like an ice cream cone, okay? If you think of it like an ice cream cone, ice cream cone is not flexible, it's not bendy. The walls are what they are, they're not gonna move. The ice cream scoop is the eyeball and then it's tethered to the tip of the cone with the optic nerve. If you start filling that cone with something else, it's gonna push that ice cream scoop up. So you have pressure on the optic nerve from two different things. One, you've got this eyeball that's trying to go in the wrong direction, it's trying to go out, and the optic nerve is trying to hold it back in. So you've got that strain on all those nerves. And in addition, this blood is filling up that cone and it's squashing the optic nerve. You're getting a compartment syndrome in the orbit. So you're just getting, you're getting ischemia, you're getting cell death, and again, this is nerve tissue. 90 minutes, this optic nerve is toast. It's gone. And there's no bringing it back. So it's really important to recognize it. Now, you don't have a CT scan. A lot of times, I don't have a CT scan when I diagnose this. I don't even, I'm looking for all, all this chemosis. I'm looking for all this swelling. But more importantly, I'm looking for, when I push on that eyeball, it's not bouncing back. So if you push on your own eyeball, close your eyes, put your finger on your eyeballs, and bounce it. Your eye bounces, it moves, right? Now push your eyebrow, push your forehead. It's not moving, right? A retrobulbar hemorrhage eye feels like this. It's not moving. It feels very firm. You can compare it to the other side. The other side's bouncing, and you're like, oh boy, this one does not feel the same. That is a retrobulbar hemorrhage, and that needs a procedure called a lateral canthotomy and cantholysis, where we cut the tendon of the eyelid to just release the pressure, give the blood a place to go. Pressure instantly goes down, eye gets softer, you've saved their vision. So I just bring it to look for it when you have these traumas and be concerned about it. Um, if the patient's awake, they'll be in pain, they'll have decreased vision. Um, it's in the setting of trauma. They fell, I've had little old ladies fall, and they're on anticoagulation. That was one of my um, lateral canthotomies I did in fellowship. Little old lady that came in and fell, they told me she had a retrobulbar hemorrhage, and I was like, come on, how is this possible? It was right in the middle of the Saints Super Bowl game. I missed the end, but she had a retrobulbar hemorrhage. 
and you know, um, she did pretty well afterwards. So significant eye findings. Th and this is just an emergency. So you want to take this to the closest ED that can manage this. Now I will tell you, ED docs are trained to do this. It is part of their residency. They don't like to do this because it's the eye. No one likes to touch the eye, and that's why I have a job. Um, so, you know, if you have a choice between two hospitals that are equidistant, and again, all else being safe for the patient, take them to the one with the ophthalmology coverage, because then you know for sure they're going to get the procedure. If not, you tell that doc on the other line, I think you're going to need to do a lateral canthotomy, canthalysis, start looking it up. And they will Google it, they will YouTube it, and then they'll do it. <laughs> because they have to, because they're ER docs. All right, we're getting close to the end, I promise. Orbital fracture, we talked about it when we talked about EOMs. I just wanted to show you some pictures. Um, so here, the nice thing about the face is there's always, almost always a control. Like if you have a normal side and abnormal side, you have something to compare to. So this orbit is normal. It's kind of like a circle that's been turned into a square. It's trying to be squared off. And then here you have a fracture, and this is actually the muscle that's stuck underneath. This is going to need kind of a more urgent repair, would have a lot of pain when you try to ask them to look up, very difficult exam. This one, here's a little crack here, the, the muscle is like shifted down a little bit, may not be as bad, we might not even have to do surgery on that one. And here's again, the, the classic is asking them to look up because the, the, the floor or the inferior wall of the orbit is what gets fractured most often. So usually if you had them look up and they can't and you see bruising and stuff, they have, they have a fracture. Um, the other thing, if you want to you know, score extra points, if you do a nerve test of the V2, so you just kind of scratch here, 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 they, this, it won't feel the same on the side with the fracture a lot of times because of the um, exit of the infraorbital nerve. It dings it and so it can get numbness here. So that can be another test um, if you so choose. And then this goes to a hospital. Ideally, if they have opto, fine. If not, ENT repairs, orbital fractures, plastic surgery will often fit, repair it, OMFS. Um, they just you know, need to be evaluated for the other stuff that probably happened along with the orbital fracture. Okay, take home points and then I'll answer any questions. Be familiar with the basic eye exam. It's really not that hard. It just takes a little bit of practice and confidence on your part. And it, you will find that you're going to be able to soothe that patient that's freaking out over the little drop of blood on their eyeball um, a lot better. You can learn about um, intracranial issues from the eye exam. And that may help you figure out what you need to do with this patient, how you're going to triage them. Irrigating is like the most important thing anytime you hear anything about anything in the eye, any foreign substance, just start irrigating it out. Um, most trauma can be managed by your local ED, whichever one you're supposed to go to. Corneal abrasions, hyphemas, orbital fractures, la lid lacks that don't involve the margin, that involve the eyebrow, lots of stuff can go to their local ED. But there's some stuff that really should go to in-house if possible. Okay, chemical burn if possible because they really should have an eye exam sooner rather than later just to ex get the extent of the damage. Ruptured globe, they might need urgent surgery, um, intraocular foreign body, marginal lid lack, and the retrobulbar hemorrhage, you know, we talked about that. All right, I'm done talking. What questions can I answer for all of you? So what happens, it's kind of like what, oh sorry, yes, so the question was about like a welder's burn to the cornea, issues with welding, and then as the provider, you know, what can you do to keep yourself safe? The issue with welding is very similar to UV light damage, so if you stare at a UV light for long enough, um, you can actually get some corneal damage similar to what you see with the chemical burn picture, you get little micro abrasions. The longer you're sort of staring and exposed at that light, you're hurting 
the outer layer of the cornea. The cornea has a couple different layers. The outer layer is, um, can be damaged relatively easily. So when you do that, you get blurry vision, you get pain, you get light sensitivity, and that's what you're getting called for, I assume. From your intents and purposes, I mean, if you're looking at it and, you know, you look and you look away, it's, what we don't want to do is be staring at it, okay? So don't look at it unless you have to, but the idea is you don't want to be staring at it. So quick blinks and sort of, it came up earlier, you know, if you looked at the sun, you know, we've all kind of like looked up and down. Nobody's blind from doing that. We don't want to do is stare at it. So it's more the time of exposure. So when you're talking about laser eye surgery for vision correction, which is like LASIK, you probably have all heard about that, or PRK, um, what they're doing is they're actually changing the shape of your cornea to adjust your prescription. The way that works is your prescription, so I have a prescription, okay? My prescription is based on two things, the shape of my cornea, three things, the shape of my cornea, the shape of my lens, and the size of my eyeball. Okay, nobody's going to change the size of my eyeball. That's what I was born with and that's what I have. My lens, someday when I need cataract surgery, it will change with that. The only thing left to change in a young person is their cornea. So what they do is with the laser, they can make a flap, lift up the flap, and then laser the surface of the cornea to actually change the shape. And it, almost like, think of it like grinding the prescription glasses grinding the right shape into the cornea so that you no longer need glasses. Then they put the flap back on. That's LASIK. In PRK, for, for instance, military personnel or people who um, are in occupations that, that are high uh, impact, so sports people, um, or even, you know, I have a friend who's an ER doc, but she plays a lot of basketball, so she doesn't want, you know, the, the flap can get dislodged. So I've been called to see people got elbowed in the eye during a, a basketball game, and I see this flap of cornea sticking up that looks like a contact lens, and I have to slowly put it back down and then call the cornea doctor and say, okay, now what do I do? <laughs> I had that in my first year in residency. And we treat that with antibiotic drops or steroid drops, or they might have to go back to the surgeon to have it you know, sort of redone. But it's not a rupture, because it's not all the way through. It's not that they flip up the whole cornea and put it back, it's just like a, micrometers of the cornea flips up, they sort of reshape the surface and then put it back down. The other way, the one for high impact people, is called PRK. And what they do, instead of making a flap that can then come up at some point in the future, they actually make a corneal abrasion. They scrape away that top layer, almost if you think of it like if your skin. Scrape away the top layer. You still have many other layers of skin. If you scrape away the top layer, you're not looking at bone or muscle. You still have uh, multiple other layers of skin. Then they reshape that and then just wait and allow the cornea to heal, which it does over a week. It is more uncomfortable for patients, um, at, but they don't have a flap then as a lifetime risk of getting dislodged. So it just depends on the person. It's a discussion that the surgeon will have with them to see what is more appropriate for their lifestyle and with their goals, and they'll obviously do a physical exam to see if their eyes are even uh, candidates to get the surgery done. Um, from your standpoint, if you got called for someone and said, I had LASIK, I, I, you know, I think I have an infection or whatnot, um, they really need to be seen by an ophthalmologist. You could take them to the ER if that's what they're insisting. I don't know what the ER doc's gonna do. They probably are gonna call ophthalmology and ophthalmology is gonna say, send them to my office tomorrow or start them on some eye drops. There's not an urgency of time, like, like some of the things I talked about, but if they were to be developing an infection, obviously you want to start the drop sooner rather than later. Um, does that answer your question? The other, yes? Um, for me, you know, when I think of eye injuries, and where I send my people to take my patients to, it's more like, is there any 
I pretend I didn't hear that. Is there anything different between University of Maryland and no, I mean, we both have ophthalmology programs. We both have residents and fellows and attendings on coverage. It's just sometimes, I'm not sure why, I don't know, insurance issues or location issues. Patients may, may not be, go to Wilmer. They might not be able to get the Wilmer people on the phone. I hear complaints from, I tried calling them, I couldn't get them. And the same thing from shock trauma. We might be full, they might divert. But from a care standpoint, you're going to get exactly the same care same quality of care at both. They both have the level that you would need to treat any of the things I talked about today. Absolutely. It's just a matter of availability. You know, I know sometimes we go on yellow. I, I'm assuming they sometimes go on yellow. So um, a lot of times it's just where you're at, who picks up the phone first, and you know, who, who can get them to faster. No, not at all. You guys have me till nine, so. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And you show a picture of an injured eye uh, being covered with a cup. Mm-hmm. The information that I was reading said it's better to cover both of them. I knew someone was going to ask me that. <laughs> so one, because you're less likely, for, uh, you're less likely to move your eyes if can't see. You have one eye covered and the other one not. The one that's covering is looking for something to stare at, to engage. Yeah, I, know, I, was, I was kind of hoping that question would come up. Um, that is something that <laughs> you, you get an A just for that. I've seen that come up in, um, I'm preparing for this talk, I took a look at some of the EMS textbooks and that is something that I've seen before. And I must have spoken to four or five different ophthalmologists. I looked in the literature. I could not find a single reason why you would do that. I have never in my entire career had a patient who had more damage to their ruptured globe or to their eye injury because they were moving their eye, their fellow eye around. And to be honest, that patient is probably already pretty anxious and scared that you told them that their eyes ruptured and then you cover the good eye. Honestly, they're still moving their eyes around under that cup. You just can't see it <laughs> because they're freaking out. Um, so I, I would not cover both eyes, to be honest. If the one eye looks healthy and normal, just try to get the patient to relax, maybe close their eyes and, and rest. But covering both eyes is going to be more stressful for them. And the movement of the eye is not going to cause that rupture to get worse. That rupture is through sclera, is through conjunctiva, is through the cornea. I mean, unless you're mashing on it, there's really not much that the patient themselves can do to make it worse. But you are not the first person to tell me that. I think I've had that at every EMS talk I've given if someone has asked that question, which is why I kept looking it up to see maybe I'm missing something, but I can't find any justification for it. Thank you. Sure. I know that if we're reading the EMS textbook, you know this on our basic eye exam, they always include an accommodation. Right. Yeah, I just did that because I didn't think any of you were doing it because I know most med students and residents aren't doing it either. <laughs> right, everyone's Perla, yes. Um, so the, the <laughs> to remind you of accommodation, accommodation is what you do when you focus. So when you're looking up close at something, your pupils constrict, it's actually part of accommodation, your lens bends, which you can't see, but also your eyes cross, right? They start to look towards each other, which is the only time that they're ever moving in opposite directions. If you think about it, your eyes actually moving, this one's moving to the left, this one's moving to the right, they're actually moving in opposite directions. It's the only time you do that. So in some neurologic conditions, you will check, they'll be moving fine or maybe not moving fine. Maybe the eye cannot look in one direction. So let's say um, they are trying to look this way, they look this way and this eye stops and this eye keeps going. And you're like, oh, this one can't move. It must be a palsy. But then you do accommodation and it moves. Well, then that's not a palsy because that muscle still needs to, to move in that direction, whether it's accommodation or it's forceful movement. So that means it's something else. Um, so it, it does help with the neurologic exam. I didn't bring it up because I didn't think any of you were doing it. <laughs> you, you talked about 
discussed from a couple of the policies, is there any way to differentiate for us between the Bell's policy and some of the ones you touched on? Absolutely. And, um, which ones should we, we be more concerned about? Absolutely. So Bell's palsy, I didn't actually mention at all, but Bell's palsy is going to involve the face in addition to the eyes. So in Bell's palsy, you get a, it's a seventh nerve palsy. So seventh nerve innervates the face. You're going to get um, you're going to get a droopy lip. You're going to get sometimes droopy eye. And the opposite of a third nerve palsy, where their eye is completely totic or closed. They can't close their eye in the seventh nerve palsy or Bell's palsy. So when you ask them to close, the side with the palsy stays open and the other one blinks. And you might even pick that up as you're talking to them. You're looking, you're like, why is only one eye blinking? And then maybe you'll, you'll ask them to smile and only half of their face goes up. Um, that is important the way you would treat any other neurologic issue more than an eye. It's, it's not an issue with anything in the eye or around the eye. It's the seventh nerve. So then you have to think of what are all the causes of a seventh nerve palsy? Is it a stroke? Is it Lyme disease? You know, is it idiopathic? Um, so those, that's going to be your pathway. And so you're going to be thinking more of a neurologic, what do I do with this, as opposed to ocular. So it's not going to need to go to anything ocular as they do. Um, but the important thing will be, from an eye standpoint, keeping that eye lubricated. If it can't close, it's going to dry out. But also trying to figure out why. So they need an MRI. Is there a brain tumor? Like, what is causing that seventh nerve palsy? So that's the Bell's palsy. Um, but yeah, thank you for bringing that up. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for your attention. I really appreciate it. Have a good evening. Drive home safely. Thank you. My pleasure. So the next talk is February the 6th, and it's trach emergencies. Right. Enough. There is often uncertainty about how to manage these patients with holes in their neck. It's a big deal. It's life-threatening. It's acute. So February 6th, and we'll be live streaming. Thanks, everyone.